It is my joy and pleasure to welcome you to the fourth Bridal Awakening Conference that is hosted by Intercessors for Kenya and Call to Come. This year, we are talking about contesting as a bride in the courts of heaven. And we are going to learn how a Christian can relate to God as father in the secret place and can relate to God as friend in the counsel of the Lord. And a Christian must also learn to relate to God as judge in the courts of heaven. This year, we are privileged to have fivefold ministers of the gospel speaking to us. We have Dr. Howard Barnes and Dr. Mike Pike from the Ministry of Call to Come. And we have Reverend Phoebe Mogo, Reverend Abokager, Pastor Benson Yangor, and Council Collins Namachanja from the Ministry of Intercessors for Kenya. We are going to run through three sessions. The first one is today, but don't forget to tune in for the next one tomorrow at the same time and the next day also at the same time. Father, we thank you because you call us into victory. Thank you because the Lord Jesus Christ won victory for us on the cross. And Lord, thank you because you call us to stand for you in our spheres of influence, in the family, in the economy, in our businesses, in every place where you've called us, oh God. And Lord, thank you because you've assured us of victory, because the Lord Jesus Christ has already won the victory. We give you praise and we give you strength and glory because we who are mere men are victorious because the Lord Jesus Christ has conquered and he has won for us. Hallelujah. Join us as we stand up for the Lord Jesus Christ, our soldiers in the kingdom of God. Hallelujah.
Today, we are going to start the conference with Dr. Howard Barnes speaking to us on the intercessory ministry of the bride in the end times. Dr. Howard Barnes is the joint co-director of Call to Come that carries the mandate in these end times to awaken the church, the ecclesia, the remnant to embrace her end time identity as the bride of Christ and begin to make herself ready. He is passionate about shifting the church away from only seeing Jesus as the savior towards also seeing him as the coming bridegroom king. He teaches that the bridal message is not just another theology, but is a paradigm into which and against which all other theologies fit and ultimately make sense. Intimacy is the currency of what should be our relationship with Jesus. Such intimacy with him is what he desires most and not our ministry, activity, or service. Recent world events have resulted in a divine lockdown, a God-given cellar, a moment where we pause and think. And this must result in a reset and realignment for the global church. Dr. Barnes is based in the UK and he has a message for the body of Christ today and he encourages us to hear what the spirit is saying. So I'm going to welcome Dr. Barnes to speak to us at this time and is speaking to us from the UK. Let me pray for him. Father, seated in our homes, we want to receive the message that you have for us through your servant, Howard Barnes. Our ears are opened and inclined to the spirit of the Lord and we ask that you'd speak to us, that you'd plant a seed in the fertile soil of our hearts, that we may receive this message to awaken us as the bride of Christ and to prepare us for the marriage supper of the Lamb. We're looking forward to understanding our intercessory ministry as the bride in these end times. In Jesus' name we pray. Welcome, Howard. I want to start today by appreciating the I4K intercessors for Kenya who are hosting this conference and uh, with whom we as Call to Come Ministries from the UK have been partnering in these conferences for the past four years. We have enjoyed the journey together as we've explored the emphasis that the Spirit is bringing to the church today, namely that of the Bride of Christ. It has been a journey of profound revelations concerning the Bride, of understanding the times and seasons that we are in and of God's eternal purposes and plans. We've not only become co-workers in the kingdom, but really good friends. Thank you so much. My task in this opening teaching session is to set the scene as best I can for the sessions that are to follow. Our conference title is Contending as the Bride in the Courts of Heaven. And I want to refer first to some of the words in that title so we understand the context of our subject. Firstly, contending. Contending suggests that there are battles to be fought and won, arguments or cases to be presented. And that is so, but even as just an intercessor praying for others or as an advocate in the courts of heaven, we must never forget, one, that whatever part we play, Jesus is our chief intercessor and advocate. And two, that it is only by virtue of the shed blood of Jesus 
that we have access to the Father who is the judge of all men and that we are found in a position of in Christ. It's this position of in Him that allows us to put our concerns and petitions to the Father and present our case and to do so in a legal and courtroom environment where there are protocols and procedures to be followed. All prayer is presented before the throne of grace and as such it takes place in a legal framework where God, our Heavenly Father, presides not only as our Father but as Judge. However, as we shall see, there are some prayer issues that demand a much more legal approach and these must be presented in a courtroom in heaven. Secondly, our title suggests that we are to contend as the bride and for some of you if this is your first visit to a conference with us then you may not understand what we mean by the bride nor the significance of the role of intercession that the bride has especially in these last days. So I need to spend a little introductory time sharing something about the bride and how important a role she has to play in the fulfilling of God's eternal purpose for his church and for his creation. Now there is no doubt that we are in at this time very significant days. Through this pandemic and subsequent lockdowns God has been imposing a divine sealer upon the word and in particular the church. The word sealer is a Hebrew word found in several Psalms, 74 times in all of the Hebrew Bible and three times in the book of Habakkuk. It's found first in 2 Kings 14 verse 7. It is like an instruction which means simply please pause and reflect or think on this. However, throughout this pandemic I would suggest that God has even been saying stop. Stop what you are doing church. You have missed the mark. You've cluttered yourself up with programs, programs and more programs, with performance, performance and more performances. But what I want from you and what I want for you is to experience my presence, my presence, my presence and more of my power. So much of what we did before we have had to stop doing. Churches have been closed and still are closed in many countries as it is in our country of the UK and we have had to discover more creative ways of worshipping and serving him and our communities. The reset button has been pressed and th through it we are discovering more about the need for intimacy with him alone. An intense journey of intimacy for the body of Christ has been initiated by the Spirit. He is no longer allowing a generation of Marthas to dictate the ministry or direction of the church, but is raising a generation of Marys who will sit at his feet who understand that the central and dominant purpose of the church is to minister firstly to the Lord and then as an intercessor with him. But the bride in these days has still the sole purpose of existence which is to love him and long to be married to him and at one with him. Revelation 4 verse 1 says, Come up here and I will show you the things that are yet to come after. Revelation 21 verse 9 goes on to tell us what those things are about. Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. We suggest that this is the season of the church when God is showing us the bride. And as we approach the time of Jesus returning, the awareness of our own bridal identity will get stronger and stronger. 
just as a bride and a bridegroom become more and more occupied with the day of their wedding and their excitement mounts, so the church will get more and more obsessed with their bridal relationship with Jesus and more focused on making herself ready. All fruitful activity and fruitful service flows out of that relationship with him. And when having made herself ready, she the bride is taken to the wedding of the Lamb, then afterwards returning to earth together with her bridegroom to reign and to rule here, yes, and about it it says, of whose government there will be no end, then and only then the kingdom of this earth will become the kingdoms of our God and his Christ. Now, in my own spiritual journey, I didn't always understand about the bride. It was late in my Christian walk that I first received a revelation of the bride that shifted everything about ministry. I'd returned to the UK from a mission in Africa and was thanking the Lord for the many salvations and miracles of healing and deliverances we had seen during that trip. I had also witnessed in various cities or regions a great miracle of many churches coming together in a deep sense of unity. It was wonderful. But then I heard the Lord say, Yes, but my church has an identity crisis. She doesn't know who she is. My response was one of confusion and surprise. Y your church is a she? Your, your church is a woman? Yes, he replied. She is Ecclesia. She is the most beautiful woman I've ever created. And I've created her out of a people from every tribe and people group and made her as one. And I'm giving her to Jesus, my son, as a love gift of a bride. So began my own journey as part of the bridal company, a journey towards the bridegroom. Why is it so important that we begin to embrace our end-time identity as the bride? It seems that around 2008, the church entered a new season, and it's been called the season of the bride but it's taken a global lockdown to shift us from what we have always been doing and to shift us from being a Martha to a Mary who just sits at his feet and to rediscover the first love of Revelation 2 verse 4 that the Lord longs to see in his people. First love. You see, the church had become too busy it had taken its eye off Jesus. And although we say we are doing it for Jesus, maybe it would be more truthful often to say that we are doing the things we did or are doing to fulfill our own visions or to satisfy our own ambitions or sense of fulfillment. As a result of the pandemic, we have had to abandon much of what we had planned to do. And many consequently, have felt lost. Some have felt so lost, even to the point of questioning their calling or ministry or even their identity. Yes, many within the church are in an identity crisis today. And what makes it worse is the fact that the Holy Spirit has transported us into a new season, which demands a new identity and which is necessary in order for us to function in the new things that God is requiring of us at this time. In past seasons of the church, the church has been taught and has taught well and learnt well many truths. But we are now in the end time season when the Holy Spirit is revealing a new truth to help us to equip and prepare us for what is to come. We have been taught that we are the body of Christ, and as such each member has a unique body part function 
whether an eye or a hand. Each part depends upon another for the growth and effective functioning of the whole. Honouring of each other and coordination and partnership is essential. Christ is the head and he gives through the Spirit the leadership and inspiration. Unity and submission is essential. This has been taught well. We have also been taught about the power of the Gospel and the need to preach as in the Great Commission, to preach about Jesus as Saviour. But whilst still holding on to these truths and seeking to work them out in practical ways in our everyday life, we now must transition into an understanding of our end time identity as the bride and to begin with Jesus not to see him just as Saviour, but to see him and ourselves, shall I say, as sons and daughters, but to see Jesus as the Bridegroom King. When Jesus returns, he will not return just as the Saviour, but as our husband. John the Baptist experienced this transition for himself because he first meets Jesus in John chapter 1. When he does, he cries out on seeing Jesus, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He saw Jesus as the Saviour, John 1 verse 29. But by the time we get to John chapter 3 verse 29, John testifies that he is not the Messiah, nor is he seeking to take followers away from the true Messiah. He is only to prepare the way for him. He says, they, the bride, are for the bridegroom. And he says of himself, I am just a friend of the bridegroom. He now sees Jesus differently and also sees his own relationship with Jesus differently as the friend of the bridegroom or the best man at a wedding. As with John the Baptist, the Church must also transition beyond the revelation of the Jesus as the Saviour to the revelation of Jesus as the Bridegroom King and we as his Bride. We must do this if ever we are to fulfil the purposes for which we were created as the Bride and pray the prayers and complete the assignments that only we as the Bride can fulfil because God has decreed it so. Do you realise that there are prayers that only the bride can pray? The Spirit and the bride cry come, Revelation 22 verse 17 for example. Have you realised that there are assignments reserved only for the married partnership between the bride and Jesus, our bridegroom king? Do you know that there are prophecies yet to be fulfilled which can only be fulfilled after the marriage of the Lamb and the bride has got married to her bridegroom and the wedding has been consummated? This pandemic has increased our expectations of the return of Jesus as the end of the age, but not all the church is ready. When the trumpet sounds, and the dead in Christ rise, and the believers living on this in, in this day rise to meet him in the air, some will be unprepared, as in the story of the ten virgins in Matthew 25. Then our engagement or betrothal will be ratified and our marriage consummated. It is at that corporate, in that corporate state, of one with him and in our transformed resurrected bodies that we will return to planet earth for a thousand years to complete those assignments reserved for us to fulfill. So the bride must make herself ready and that readiness starts by embracing that identity and learning to let it become not just a, a new revelation added to our knowledge alongside other important revelations, but a paradigm in which we live and move and have our being 
and against which all other revelations and theologies find their deepest meaning and significance. Now I'd like to talk for a moment about the authority of the bride. The bride, like her husband, our Lord Jesus, is an intercessor. Jesus, the chief and eternal intercessor. Hebrews 7 verse 25 says, He, Jesus, can do this because he always lives and intercedes for them. He has ultimate authority, but is delegated to his bride great authority also. It is so important that when we consider our bridal role in the context of an intercessor that we appreciate this. Without this God-given authority, we would not be able to intercede effectively and certainly not be able to operate in the courts of heaven. Whenever we pray or ask God for anything on our own behalf or interceding on behalf of others, we are coming before the throne of grace, as Scripture calls it. And this too has a legal connotation. God may be our Father, but our request is being heard from the throne where he sits and presides and judges. Not only is our Father listening to us as a Father, and he is concerned for us and loves us dearly and wants, as any Father does, to grant our requests, but also, and especially when the petition is very serious and has legal considerations, we are led to present them as in a courtroom where the case will be presented, discussed, and then judged on, and a verdict given. Now this understanding is relatively new to the Church. And for many years God, because of his great grace, has overlooked our lack of understanding, our lack of knowledge of the legal procedure, and our following of the correct protocol, and has graciously answered our prayers anyway. But now, now is the time for the sons of God to become mature and prepare for the time when, as the bride, we will judge the nations and rule and reign with him. So now the Spirit of God is educating and preparing us. This is a new season, and greater understanding, revelation and wisdom has been granted in preparation for the age to come. We are now being trained to understand heaven's operational procedures and to exercise the authority we have been granted, whether it is by presenting cases for judgment or decreeing or proclaiming prophetically something into being. Several years ago, I came to appreciate that there are degrees of authority and understood that the strength of that authority was relative to the manner in which we approach God. We can approach him with our petition, for example, as an individual believer, as in singular, or as a group of people, as in plural, or as the bride, as in corporate. Each stance, from singular to plural to corporate, is accompanied by a greater degree of delegated authority. Firstly, there is individual or singular authority as a son or daughter. As believers, we have been adopted into the Father's family, are encouraged to call him Abba, Daddy. Jesus teaches us in Luke chapter 11 that when we pray, we are to say, Our Father who is in heaven. Romans 8 verse 15 reminds us that the spirit you received brought about the, your adoption to sonship, and so we call him Abba, Father. As sons and daughters, we are not only seated in him in heavenly places, Ephesians 2 verse 6, but are also heirs of all that the kingdom has, including authority before him to ask for anything in my name, John 14 verse 14. However, we do best to remember once again that it is only because of the blood of Jesus shed for us that this is possible. The blood gained our legal right to access all these privileges and all the promises of God. Romans 8 verse 17 says, If his children, 
then we are also heirs indeed of God and joint heirs of Christ. The blood gives us confidence that we can come therefore boldly before the throne of grace, which is a court of heaven. Hebrews 4 verse 16. And knowing that we will have mercy and be shown total righteousness in his judgments. Then there is plural group or group authority as believers. The Bible makes it clear that when more than one person brings a request to God and are agreed on what they should ask, then they have access to greater authority. Jesus tells us in Matthew 18 verse 19 that if two of you agree here on earth concerning anything you ask for, it will be given of my Father in heaven. This prayer of unity and in agreement carries a great weight of authority. And finally, corporate authority. The bride of Christ is not singular, as in, I am a bride, nor is it plural, as in, we are the brides of Christ. There are not many brides, there's only one bride. But the bride of Christ is said to be always corporate. And herein is a profound mystery. This is difficult, difficult to understand, a difficult concept to grasp. But it is very necessary that we do because our understanding of this revelation will release in us a, a great confidence towards God and in our prayer life. When we pray as the bride, we never pray on our own, as in singular, but as a company of believers in their thousands and even millions, past, present and future, and all praying as one in perfect union. The bride is one, just as we are in him and he in us. We are one. When I embrace my bridal identity, I become part of a corporate being, and God has released to that corporate person of the bride the grace of receiving and exercising an authority and power that only the bride can know. It is, for example, to the bride that the kingdom is given, as illustrated in the story of Esther. The bride has the ear of the king. She has his full attention. And because of his intense love for her, she occupies a unique place in relationship to him. Likewise, the bride of Christ has a unique relationship to Jesus and his Father and is able to enter his presence and into his courts with even greater assurance of being heard. However, she must still understand the legal proceedings and the correct protocol, just as Esther, though the, she was the king's wife, had to observe them. Session 2 will describe some of the protocols and proceedings and session four of this conference will show us in detail how Esther intercedes while still observing all necessary protocols. To intercede as the bride in the heavenly courts is such a privilege. And when she does, the angels are in attendance. Jesus, our great intercessor, is officiating as advocate, but also as her bridegroom king and the whole of heaven is ready to hear the judgment. In Luke chapter 11, we have recorded Jesus' teaching on prayer. Jesus tells us three stories in which we are uh, approaching God in three different roles and from three different perspectives. First, we come to him as our father, asking him to meet our needs as his children. We are, as we saw earlier, to call him Abba, Father. He then teaches us how to, to model prayer by giving us what we now call the Lord's Prayer, but perhaps it's better to think of it as the disciples' prayer. In this prayer, he invites us to ask the Father for our daily needs. Give us this day our daily bread. Then, in the same chapter, in verses 5 and 6, we read of the story of the friend coming to a neighbour at midnight to request bread for a guest who has come unexpectedly. Here we are encouraged to see God as our friend and come to him on behalf of other friends. 
This is interceding for one another's needs. But then in Luke 18 and verses 1 to 8, we find a different kind of situation. We read here how a woman goes to a judge to plead with him to pass judgment on a situation that was troubling her. Here we are coming to God as judge. This type of prayer is presented by someone needing a legal judgment to be made in dealing with an adversary and this type of prayer is heard in the courtroom of heaven. There are many situations in life when this needs to happen. Sometimes our advers adversary is Satan himself making false accusations against us but is doing so through a series of events, conversations, gossip, lies, slander, working out through people in the visible world here on earth. Seeking God's wisdom reveals the spiritual nature of the problem, and it's at this point that we can ask to enter a court of heaven to present our case and contend for a favourable outcome. Or there may be a situation on earth where we discern a delaying or interfering tactic of the enemy. It may not manifested itself on earth yet, but we can perceive in our spirit that it's part of Satan's strategy as it threatens to delay the fulfilment of God's purposes. This is time then to take action in the spiritual realm and ask to enter a court in heaven and to petition the Father to make a judgment on the basis of just and fair legal grounds which we present and then he will decree and pronounce a judgment upon the adversary, a judgment with conditions that are binding and for which there is no appeal. Sometimes we are led to contend for a nation and just as Esther was offered half the kingdom, so we can believe to ask for the nations. In Psalm 2 verse 8, God says, Ask of me, and I will give you the nations. And in Jeremiah 1 verse 10, God promises to set him over the nations. In Revelation 2 verse 26 we read, And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give him power over the nations, as I have also received from my Father. So it is clear that a vital part of our role as a bridal intercessor is to contend for the nations, and we can do this pleading our case based on 1. the promises of Scripture, 2 the known purposes and will of God to redeem the nation, and three, any prophecies spoken by present-day prophets over that nation. But be assured of this, the Holy Spirit will give you all you need in terms of advice and guidance as you prepare your petition. After the case has been presented, discussed, then the judgment is made. Eventually a decision will be made. Whatever the nature of the petition, all cases will be heard before the judge of all men and in the presence of our chief advocate, the Lord Jesus, and the court officials, and here a judgment will be made. When the judgment is about to be given concerning a spiritual or demonic adversary or accuser, that adversary will be summoned to hear the ruling. Let us be clear that as the Bride of Christ we have that invitation, that legal right of access, and as the Bride of Christ we have that authority. This authority is given only to the Bride, and so underlines the reason why we must now understand and embrace our bridal identity, and learn to live at all times within the bridal paradigm. It is to be our persona for the age to come, and we must learn to embrace it with confidence. As Hebrews 4 verse 16 says, Let us therefore come boldly and with confidence before the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Amen. 
Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Howard Burns, for sharing with us about the bride and the intimacy that she enjoys with the bridegroom king. I want us to pray and bring those issues that uh, we have learned before the Lord in prayer. Precious Lord, our bridegroom king, we pray at this time that you give us grace as your bride to enjoy and the outpouring of your Holy Spirit upon the bride to awaken throughout the church in our time. We pray, Lord, that as, just as you warned us in the parable of the virgins, you said that there were wise virgins and foolish virgins. We do not want to be counted among the foolish virgins. We pray that we will be counted among the wise ones who had extra oil in their vessels in addition to the oil that they had in their lamps. We pray, Abba Father, that you will, O Lord, pour your spirit upon us to enable us to have light in our lamps, but additional oil that will keep us burning so that when, O God, the trumpet sounds and the shofar is blown and we hear the sound saying, the, bride is, the bridegroom is coming, but Lord, we will pour the additional oil which is in the vessel into our lamps and we'll be able to meet you. We don't want to be left out when the time comes. So we speak to the body of Christ that you arise and wake up now. It's not a time to sleep. Awake, O sleeper, and hear the sound of the shofar blowing and commanding us to look up. It's time for the bride, for the church, to transition into a bridal paradigm. Let's pray, Father, according to the word of God in the book of Revelation chapter 19 and verse number 7. And it says, let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the Lamb has come. And her bride, his bride rather, has made herself ready. Father, we pray for the bride to make herself ready for partnership with the bridegroom king. Only the wise virgins will be allowed to join the bridegroom in his bridal chamber. And we pray that we will be part of that group that is called out to leave the others in the harem outside, but join with the bridegroom in his bridal chamber. chamber. Father, we pray that this will be our Lord. I also want us to pray for increase in discernment. We need to be aware of who we are and understand our authority. Let's pray. Precious Lord, we pray for an increase of discernment and understanding of our authority as we intercede as a bride of Christ. Our position is that we are your partner, that we are part of you, that the authority that you have, oh Lord, you have invested in your bride, that we are your queen, that we are called to work with you with the same authority, with the same understanding, that we do not operate the way the other uh, the women were left in the harem outside. For us, we are not part of the outside harem. We are your very bride. And so we pray for this understanding and this discernment in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We also pray uh, for a deeper reality of our intimacy with Jesus as our chief intercessor and advocate from which all discernment and wisdom flows. And so we pray, Lord Jesus, that you give us a deeper reality of who we are as a bride. For indeed, our strength is drawn from our intimacy with you because we are the wife of the Lamb, as your word says, that the wife of the Lamb, the bride, has made herself ready. So we pray that we will, O oh God, operate from a deeper reality of our intimacy. For indeed, from uh, the book of Genesis all the way to Revelation, you have been wooing your bride. And that in the end, you will now unveil us that we may know who we are. Because indeed, the culmination of all things is that the bride is ready to join the bridegroom in the bridal chamber. We pray, O oh God, as you said, that you are going to prepare a place for us so that where you are, that there we may be also with you. Your desire is that we may dwell with you and be happy with you ever after. And so we pray that this reality will dawn on us in the church, that we are called for intimacy and to dwell with our bridegroom king forever and ever. And finally, we pray for wisdom, for respect, for the fear of the Lord, and courage and boldness to contend effectively in the courts of heaven. Precious Lord, who, apart from the bride, 
You can pray the prayers that you want us to pray and win your favor without discrimination. For indeed, when your bride calls, you know that is my partner. That's the one that was taken from my side that is calling. That's the one who is my partner that is calling. And so, Lord, when the enemy has laid an accusation against us, when the enemy desires to kill us and to destroy us, we come to you. Not just as a voice shouting from outside, but we want to, sh uh, to cry to you from a place of intimacy, from a place of, uh, uh, of, of, of closeness. But, Lord, even with a whisper, you will still hear us. So we pray for wisdom. Like, just like it was with Esther. Wise, approaching a husband with wisdom, with respect, with honor, and the fear of the Lord. But also with courage and boldness, knowing that she has a right to be heard by the husband who is king. And that, Lord, our position will be strengthened from the heavenly court. That we will contend effectively in the courts of heaven and have decisions that, O oh Lord, you have will for us to, O oh God, win against the enemy accusation. This is our prayer with thanksgiving. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. We've been deceived by the devil too long. We're going to tell the devil's kingdom.
second speaker for this session is our spiritual counsel, Collins Namachanja, and is coming to speak to us about the protocols in the courts of heaven. Minister Collins Namachanja is a leader and trainer with intercessors for Kenya, overseeing prayers in the seven mountains of government, education, family, religion, economy, celebration, and communication. He has been an advocate of the High Court of Kenya for 25 years with post-admission experience. He's also anointed to take cases to the courts of heaven. Collins is happily married to Emma and they, have, they are blessed with three sons. Let us pray for Collins as he comes to minister to us. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we receive your servant with thanksgiving. Our hearts and our ears are open to receive what you are going to teach us and instruct us on this pertinent topic of the right protocols to enter the courts of heaven. Speak to us in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. I welcome us to our discussion on the introduction to the protocols in the courts of heaven introduction to the protocols in the courts of heaven. I don't know whether you have ever received a summons to appear before court, but I know that for most of us within our local context, when we hear about courts, or let alone being someone to attend court or to appear in court, it generally and most times spells trouble. So most of us have grown avoiding court. Um, really you don't want anything to do with court um, as a witness or otherwise. But I want to assure you that our discussion on the courts of heaven, the courts of heaven are not like that, at least within our local context, our local jurisdiction, and how our courts run. The first time I read the Bible uh, with understanding was when I had just uh, joined college. Um, law school some years back and after I'd given my life to Christ. Reading through the Bible, I was uh, pretty fascinated with the well laid out uh, principles, um, legal principles in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, specifically chapter 16 uh, from verse 18 to 20 that talks about appointment of judges for Israel and how they were to run the judicial system in serving the people of God. Later on, I, I go to realize actually that um, our own uh, judicial system is uh, founded upon the very same principles, Judeo-Christian principles. And so our discussing about the courts of heaven is not really a mistake. Uh, if God could lay out specific directions on how Israel was to run its judicial system and bearing in mind that we know that what happens on earth is really a shadow of the real in heaven, then there must be a judicial system in heaven. Indeed, it is what is gaining ground and popularity within uh, the believer circles in the understanding of the courts of heaven. Uh, that's what it is, and that's what we, we seek to discuss uh, today. So the courts of heaven are really places where the legal proceedings of heaven are carried out. Cases are brought before God, who sits as a supreme judge. Witnesses are called and witnesses testify and rulings and decisions are made. It's a governmental court in the heavens before which all accusations on earth and heaven must be brought for a decision to be made by the judge. So just as there are earthly courts, so there are courts of heaven in which legal proceedings take place. For us then, it becomes important to understand the operation of these courts of heaven 
if we want to unlock, especially those perennial problems that have afflicted, as we have prayed, we have fasted, but they have not moved, potentially what remains to be done is for one to access the courts of heaven, deal with the potential legal grounds the enemy could be using to, to, to oppose or to block the answer coming to, to, to whoever is praying or even to you. So we then have to understand how the courts of heaven operate and how we can approach and how we can get our verdicts to inform our victories. Courts of heaven in the Bible are actually, they are pictures, they, 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 they are various portions of scripture running from the Old Testament to the New Testament that talk of the courts of heaven. But if you are like me, um, probably you've experienced it without ever knowing that you are dealing with something in, before the courts of heaven. I remember my first experience was we were out in Israel um, with a ministry and we were doing prayer uh, for Israel and we were before the cave of Machpelah where Abraham and, and, and his sons and, and Sarah are buried in Hebron. And at that point we, we, we sought to pray for the nation of Israel specifically the agitation as to the right of ownership of the land, who owns the land of Israel. And I was given the privilege of praying, and without knowing, we had um, a Jewish brother with us. And I, I sought him, took him, and put him in the midst of the, the, the team, and, and told God, he is my witness, uh, representing the people of Israel. And we had a wonderful session of intercession, addressing the judge and arguing, looking at scripture, laying out the basis as to why Israel owns that land. It was much later, years down actually the line, that we, I, I go to understand, we go to understand, we had actually done a court of heaven session for the nation of Israel. Wonderful experience. So potentially you have done this, but you actually have not gotten to put it into context that you have appeared before the courts of heaven. But within um, the setup of the Bible, there are a number of uh, references to, to the courts of heaven. The first one, I'll just refer to one or two. In Job chapter 1, verse 6 to 12, it is recorded that there was a day when the sons, that is the angels of God, came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan, the adversary or the accuser, also came among them. A discussion ensued between God and Job, uh, sorry, God and Satan, concerning Job. And um, Satan tells the Lord, actually accuses Job, that Job serving you is not very genuine. His heart is not very pure. His motives are not very pure. So, Satan says, if you were to allow me to test him for you, you will really establish that Job is serving you on account of his own personal reasons, and, and his motive is not right. So, God allows and permits Satan to attack Job with sores and, 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 and plagues, and, and indeed, takes Job down for, for, for a long while as, as, as you read the whole book of Job ch from chapter 1 to the end. But the key thing here is where did uh, Satan get this permission? Where did Satan stand to accuse Job? Satan being an adversary with accusing or accuser both are legal terms which then implies that Satan was actually before the courtrooms of heaven standing to accuse Job, much the way he does with all of us every day. He's, he's termed the accuser of the brethren, so he does that on a daily basis before the courts. Now, for, for, for us, for us, much like Job, we have to realize what's going on. 
In fact, Job much later on must have realized that what was taking place was something that generated from the courts of heaven. That is why in Job 13 verse 3, he says, But I desire to speak to the Almighty and to argue my case with God. And then in 13, 18, he says, Now that I have prepared my case, I know that I'll be vindicated. I suppose that the prevailing circumstances and potentially Job may have prayed over this. He came to understand that the problem could only be resolved if he approached the courts of heaven. Equally, in, in Luke chapter 18, verse 1 to 8, in illustrating the fact that men ought always to pray and not to faint or give up, the Lord uses the parable of a widow going before a wicked judge, repeatedly pleading that she be vindicated against her enemy. The Lord actually paints a picture of a courtroom with this widow going before the judge repeatedly. The setting is a courtroom. I was, as I was preparing this message, I, 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 w I came across a Psalm 50, and, and as I was reading through, I suddenly had the insight that the setting of Psalm 50 is actually a court process. The setting is, is a courtroom session. Just, just running through very quickly, verses 1 to 3 of Psalm 50 describe God, the mighty one, God, the, the Lord. He speaks and summons the earth. So, God speaks and summons the earth. Summons is a legal term. Summoning someone, calling someone to attend or to appear before court for a specified purpose. So, God summons the earth to appear, to respond to a court process. In verse 4, the Bible says that he, God, calls to the heavens above and to the earth that he may judge his people. The heavens and the earth are being called as witnesses so that he, God, may judge the earth. And here God actually appears then as a party or a complainant as well as the judge. In verse 5, the people who are being summoned are described. They are the faithful ones who made a covenant with God by sacrifice. These people form the other party to the court process. They are the ones with a right standing before God. They are described as the covenant people. Then in verse 6 of Psalm 50, it records the testimony of the heavens before the court. The heavens actually testify. The verse reads, The heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is judge. God is a righteous judge. So, even though he is both a party or a complainant and judge, he will do right because he is righteous. Creation testifies to God's righteousness. In verse 7, God says he will testify against his people. His testimony has to do with his complaint against the people. He is to lay out his charge or complain against them by his testimony. Imagine God the judge testifying against you. In verse 8 to 13, in, in laying out his case, in laying out his case, God first commends the people for what they have done right. The sacrifices and the burnt offerings have continually been made before him. He acknowledges that. But then he reminds them that he need not accept all these offerings, the bulls and the he gods, because he owns them anyway. He owns the beasts of the forest, the cattle on a thousand hills are his, even the birds of the air. And in fact, 
the whole world and everything in it is his. Then God poses a rhetoric question in verse 13 as to whether he eats the flesh of bulls or drinks the blood of goats. In 14, verse 14, God brings out the charge proper against his covenant people, ingratitude and breach of their vows to him. He says, offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and pay your vows to the Most High, which, if the people had done, would have resulted in God answering them with deliverance, and then they would have in turn glorified his name. That's in verse 15. In other words here, the people have had their priorities wrong. That is the basic premise of God's charge against them. They need to reverse the order of their priorities. Then in verse 50, 50, in verse 1 of chapter 50, remember, he summoned the earth, everything in the earth, all its inhabitants. So in verse 16, the wicked also then appear in the court process to answer charges that God has against them. In uh, verse 16, God says to the wicked, what right have you to recite my statutes or take my covenants on your lips? The wicked are actually told within the context of the court setting that they have no right standing. They have no legal standing to recite God's statutes or to take his covenants on their lips. They are not properly suited, so to speak, to invoke God's name. And because they have done so, when they had no right to, God now lays a charge against them. And in that charge, then God lays out the reasons why. That runs from verse 17 to 21. They hate discipline, God says. They pay no regard to God's word. They are friends with a thief. They keep company with adulterers. They are deceitful. They speak wickedness. They are slanderers of their brothers. And while they are doing these things, they have this imagination in their hearts that because God is silent, then God is like them. And then God rebukes them for that. Verse 50, 21, the part B says, but now I rebuke you and lay the charge before you. Then we come to the verdict. The judge renders his verdict first to the wicked in Psalm chapter 50, verse 22, by saying, Mark this then, you who forget God, lest I rend and there be none to deliver. The verdict is an expression of God's mercy and call to repentance. The wicked are directed to repent, and if not, his wrath then will break out and there will be no deliverance. As we know, no one can deliver from God's hand. And to the righteous, to his covenant people, the verdict is expressed in Psalm 50 verse 23, which is actually a direction that they should honor God by bringing thanksgiving sacrifices and by ordering their ways aright. The verdict mirrors the charge that God lays against the covenant people in verses 14 and 15. One observation we can make from this uh, court proceedings is that you will note that the covenant people and the wicked against whom the charges are laid, they, they have no respondent. They actually do not get to respond. I thought that when the charges are based on a breach of God's word, then we have no defense. The word is a basis upon which all charges are made. The case is built upon the word, so there is no response we can make. As, as, as we saw earlier, the heavens and the earth are his creation. And as his creation, they know the truth. And having been summoned to testify before the court, his creation, the heavens and the earth, then testify against the people 
telling them that they are not being faithful and true to their creator. Let's now look at the protocols in the courts of heaven. Operating in the courts of heaven means that we have to move in the realms of the supernatural. We get a picture of this in Zechariah chapter 3 verse 1 to 7, which records a courtroom of heaven session in which Satan lays accusation against Joshua the high priest. Zechariah 3, 6, 7 says, And the angel of the Lord enjoined Joshua. Thus says the Lord of hosts, If you will walk in my ways and keep my charge, then you shall rule my house and have charge of my courts, and I'll give you the right of access among those who are standing here. Joshua, a mortal man like you and I, is promised access into the supernatural realm. This means that we too have that access. The demand this makes on us is that we, then we have to shed off our traditional um, mold of thinking that is steeped in religion and doctrines that are actually dead. We then have to have a shift of our mindsets that will allow us to see our true selves as spiritual beings called to operate in the supernatural realm. We bear the image of God our Father. He is spirit. He dwells in the supernatural. Our DNA then, so to speak, is of a supernatural nature. Protocols refer, in a sense, to the official procedure or rules governing the affairs of an institution. In this case, the affairs of the courts of heaven. Implication to get here is that there are set procedures that one must adhere to to successfully appear and operate in the courts of heaven. We have to understand how the courts of heaven function. Our earthly courts have procedures that must be followed both in prosecuting cases and in the general etiquette of those appearing before the judges. It is the same with the courts of heaven. We will highlight some of them here. The first thing to bear in mind is that the courtroom of heaven is not a battlefield. One thing to note is that as we step in the courtroom, it is not a case of warfare. It's not spiritual warfare. Warfare belongs to the battlefield. In the courtroom, it's about presenting your case. It's, it's about laying out your arguments uh, logically, based on facts. It's about making petitions and asking for remedies, for reliefs. What do we want the court to give us based on the facts and the evidence that we have presented? As a matter of fact, it's good to mention that the courtroom has no place for tears. The tears of intercession are not fit for the courtroom. Weeping will not get your results in the courtroom of heaven. I remember a trial I was doing some years back. Um, a witness was in the stand for cross-examination. So as we progressed, uh, the witness got extremely emotional uh, and he began sobbing uncontrollably. It was disconcerting for the rest of us, including counsel, uh, because uh, he was a man in his 60s and the judge was a lady in her 40s. Um, within our cultural context, um, a man of that level weeping uncontrollably uh, is, is a scene that we are not used to. So what happened? The court had to adjourn. Uh, the session was stopped. The proceedings were stopped uh, so that the witness could go. And, and recollect himself. Picture yourself weeping and wailing in the courts of heaven. The proceedings might actually adjourn so that you go and recollect yourself, then you come and present your case properly. Please remember that. Then secondly, learn to approach God as judge. Traditionally, we have known how to approach God as our father, uh, based on Luke 11, chapter 2, 
Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Give us this day our daily bread. We go to our Father for our daily needs, for our personal needs. And then we have also known how to approach God as a friend. We know the parable the Lord gives in Luke chapter 11, verse 5 to 8, uh, where a friend goes to another friend for help because this friend has had a friend who has come to him in the night and he does not have food. That pictures intercession. We know how to do that. But with the courtroom of heaven, we have to approach God as judge. The picture is presented in Luke chapter 18, verse 2 to 3, actually further down, which I've already referred to, in which the widow presents her case before the unjust judge. It's a picture of a litigant before the judge. So you, as an intercessor, or you approaching the courts, actually are a litigant seeking remedy, seeking relief. The widow kept on saying, vindicate me against my adversary. The adversary, remember, cannot Satan in our context. So even for us in the courtroom of heaven operations, we have to remember to approach God as the judge. And then remember, it's not so much about our purposes, your purposes, your needs. Let it be tied to the kingdom purposes of God. We are seeking his purposes to advance his kingdom, to advance his agenda. So we appear before him with that mindset. Even your personal needs actually, to an extent, are tied to the kingdom agenda. Your personal needs need to be met so that you can fulfill your prophetic destiny and serve your redemptive purpose. It's all tied to God's purposes for us. Now, the protocol of approaching God as judge requires that we come with reverence and reasonable evidence. Judicial decisions are made on the basis of relevant evidence presented by credible witnesses. Relevance and materiality of the evidence presented and the credibility of the witnesses. And the other aspect to remember, which is very critical actually, is a question of jurisdiction. A dictionary definition of jurisdiction is the territory or sphere of activity over which the legal of authority of a court or other institution extends. In our context then, we have our areas or spheres of influence. God has given each one of us a sphere of operation. There's that area within which we have been given the mandate to operate and influence the behavior and the conduct of the relevant atmosphere there. Paul talks of keeping within the limits of God, the limits God has apportioned for all of us or for him. 2 Corinthians 10, 13, but we will not boast beyond limit, but we'll keep the limits God has apportioned us to reach even you. That's what the scripture says. We cannot exceed our jurisdiction Otherwise, we'll have no legal authority. Neither can we extend it, nor overreach. Out of years of practice, courts will tell us that jurisdiction is everything. When a court has no jurisdiction, it will down its tools immediately. It will not go any further. So, Anything done without jurisdiction is without legal sanction and is therefore of no legal effect. For all intents and purposes, it's null and void. And it opens itself within the spiritual realm to counterattacks from Satan. I've always used the example of uh, governors in one county. Their influence, though 
they are all governors is restricted to the territorial jurisdiction of the individual governor. One governor cannot move from one part of the nation to the other to exercise jurisdiction there or even states because they are president of one state or governor of one state. They cannot do that. Each person has his sphere of influence marked out and recognized by law. For us equally then, our jurisdiction must be noted and recognized in the courts of heaven before we can effectively exercise it. So for us to then have any impact at all, or for you to have any impact at all, in the courtroom of heaven setting, you must have jurisdiction to operate there. Which then means that you need to know your jurisdiction. You need to know at which level you have been empowered to operate. For all of us, we can present petitions or cases relating to our personal matters and family matters, according to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, that says, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. However, when it comes to petitioning the courts of heaven for nations, for cities, um, for territories, the realm of jurisdiction is different. For our purposes in this discussion today, it's just to note that only those who have been granted jurisdiction should engage principalities and powers controlling territories. I remember a story that I always tell here uh, from our team leader, and she was narrating about this gentleman, um, some place in Uganda, who decided he needed to confront the powers behind a particular shrine uh, because he was uh, a believer covered by the blood of Christ and with authority to confront them. But as he entered the compound of the shrine and was walking towards it, a voice came out from the shrine and asked, who are you? And uh, before he knew it, um, he had lost his mind and he became mad. Highlighting the significance of jurisdiction. Only deal with what the Lord has assigned you and given you the mandate to deal with. That actually builds into the example that we get from Acts chapter 19, verse 13 to 17, that tells us of the sons of Sceva, who sought to use the name of Jesus to cast out demons without authority. They wanted to use Christ, but they didn't have a personal knowledge of him. They had no basis. The result was disastrous. The, they were all beaten by the demons. The other aspect to consider in the issue protocols is preparation. First, prepare yourself. Repentance is key. Walking in holiness and purity is a necessity if you will get any results from the courtrooms of heaven. Tied to that is a question of dressing. Athlete courts require lawyers and litigants to dress properly. God also requires that your heart must be properly dressed to appear before him. God's expectation is that you rend your heart and not your garments. You cannot haphazardly appear before the courts on earth. Improper dressing will actually mean you have no audience before the courts. I'll presume that it's actually the same with the courts of heaven. I, I remember um, um, a court session that one of our team members shared quite recently, actually not so far in the distant future, where <coughs> they had an appointment 
they were told to present their case before the courts at 11 a.m. And the sister who was sharing was the person leading this group. And she told them, dress appropriately. Now, she was narrating to me that when the session began, first of all, some went late. So there was a problem in the courtroom that the session had started late. And then secondly, one of them had dressed casually like they were going out for a picnic. And again, there was an issue with that, 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 that she didn't observe the decorum as instructed by the leader, which then built into the aspect of obeying instructions and taking the necessary steps as you prepare to appear before the courtroom. Of course, they had to do a lot of repenting before they were allowed to proceed with the case. Related to preparation is preparing your case. Adequately prepare before you present your case. Re look into your books. What does your book say about you? What is your prophetic destiny? If it's a question for your children, what does the book say about, what do their books say about them? Your purpose, what are you meant to fulfill? Your purpose in terms of your prophetic destiny, redemptive purpose, if it is a question of the nations, what does the book for that particular nation say? You remember that in Psalm 139 verse 16, yeah? Each one of us has a book and our purposes are recorded there. It will be key to know that whatever you're presenting before the courtroom is tied to your purpose or the purpose for that nation, so to speak. And then remember, the word of God itself is very central. It is key so that anything presented must line up with scripture. What does scripture say about the case, about the situation? that you seek to present before God. Perchance there have been prophecies spoken over your life, prophecies spoken over the nation. For example, Kenya, we have a number of prophecies that we are continually praying into and going before the courts of heaven saying, Father, you have said this concerning our nation. They are all recorded. At an individual level, is there anything that you can pick up and build into your preparation of the case? All this with the understanding at the back of your mind that the conflict at hand is a legal one at the first instance. And then, of course, you will need to know the judicial officers that operate in the courts of heaven. God is the judge, as we are told in James chapter 4, verse 12. His judgments, his decisions, his findings, his decrees and directions are final and they are not subject to appeal. Jesus is our advocate. 1 John 2 1. He makes intercession for us in the courts of heaven. You start and he is there to intercede, to argue for you. He does it as our advocate. Then we have the Holy Spirit, our counselor which actually translates to our advocate. He comes to our rescue whenever we are unable to adequately present a case before the judge. So the picture is this. Jesus is our advocate in the heaven, before the court, helping us while the Holy Spirit is on earth, guiding and empowering us to make a successful case in the courtroom. The other party, of course, you have already mentioned, Satan, accuser of the brethren. He's more or less the opposing attorney. We have the angels, which are uh, of different categories, functioning as the court bailiffs, functioning as the court registrars, functioning as clerks, to help the judge undertake the court process in, 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 the, in due order. Helping filing of petitions, arranging the motions, bringing the case files, and opening the legal books that may be referred to. We then have the witnesses. There's a great cloud of witnesses which has a role in the courts of heaven. Again, witness, as we saw in Psalm 50, has a legal connotation to it. 
In Hebrews 12, 1, it speaks of those who testify in court. This cloud of witness are those who testify in court. They have a voice in the courts of heaven concerning the kingdom purposes for which they lay down their lives. They have a right to speak because they have won for themselves a good testimony, which is about judicial approval. Just going back to the, the sharing I, I, I did at first, my first appearance in the courts of heaven at Hebron in Machpelah, our team leader, as we were praying together, she, she, she had a vision of what was actually taking place. And one of the people watching over the process and agreeing with the submissions we were making was Abraham, one of the witnesses from above, watching over to see and approve and support anyone walking in the kingdom purposes for which they lived their lives for. Then we have the spirits of just men made perfect, referred to in Hebrews 12, verse 23. The saints of old who are still interested in the cause for which they led their lives, they gave their lives. They are in the court releasing their testimony, releasing the voice and testimony on behalf of those who must now complete the work for which they gave their lives. More like they handed over the baton, and those who took the baton and running with it are now being supported from the heavens through the spirits of just men made perfect. As a final note, just on this aspect, of course, there are other aspects of the protocol, but I've just picked this for our purposes for, for this session. There's need to remember that you may have a good case, but you end up losing because of the breach of the protocols, or because of ignorance of established processes, or because of simply bad preparation, that you didn't get all your facts together before you moved to the courtroom. The bride in the courts of heaven. Let's, let's look at that the bride in the courts of heaven. Our typical approach to the courts previously has been largely in the context of seeking to unblock or remove legal grounds that Satan has used to block our petitions that are limited to personal needs. But there is large room for us to petition the courts for the destiny of nations, cities, and territories. It is here that I think the bride of Christ has a role to play. The bride's mandate first is to prepare herself for the soon coming husband. She is to sound out the alarm to the nations that the husband king is at the door and that the nations need to be ready lest he finds them unprepared. This the bride can do by petitioning the courts of heaven for the removal of all the satanic hindrances that have hindered the nations from hearing and accepting the full measure of the gospel. Let's consider, how can the bride do this? First, let's remember the bride is a warrior bride. She's raised up and seated with Christ in the heavenly places. But at the same time, she has her feet planted on earth, on the land, as a warrior. In this capacity, she carries multiple mantles that enable her to serve as a prophetess or a prophet, gender. There is no man or woman within the bride to prepare the way for the Lord, her husband. So using royal decrees from the court of heaven, she brings alignment between heaven and earth. She is clothed with a double portion mantle that enables her to see clearly both within the earthly and heavenly realms. This means 
that she is well equipped and able to operate in the supernatural realm where the courts of heaven are. Accordingly then, she is able to effectively wage war against the principalities and powers, first by getting verdicts against them in the courts of heaven, and then coming onto the battlefield to engage in war against them. As she engages the courts of heaven, she is able to access a multiple courts or hierarchy. In fact, I think the bride can access all the courts of heaven in their respective hierarchies. But for now, she's able to access the courts of war for battle strategies for the destinies of the nation. So, she will receive judgment and then she'll receive battle strategy from the courts of war from which then she launches out to engage against the enemy. She cannot be defeated. She already has a judgment and then she has battle strategy. With her prophetic mantle, the bride can access the court of councils, receive the word of the Lord and proclaim it to God's people to lead them in the right way. This is much in line with what Jeremiah, the prophet, says. In Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 18, the prophet says, For who among them has stood in the counsel of the Lord to perceive and to hear his word? Or who has given heed to his word and listened? And then in 23, 21 to 22, the Lord says, I did not send... I did not send the prophets, yet they read. I did not speak to them, yet they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel, then they would have proclaimed my words to my people, and they would have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. She can access the court of counsels. Pick what the Lord is saying concerning the nations. Then come and prophesy. It's the same thought expressed in Revelation 10, verse 8 to 11, which says, Then the voice which I had heard from heaven spoke to me again, saying, Go, take the scroll which is open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and told him to give me the little scroll. And he said to me, Take it and eat. It will be bitter to your, mar to your stomach, but sweet as honey in your mouth. And I took the little scroll from the hand of the angel and ate it. It was sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. And I was told, you must again prophesy about many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. The bride accesses the court of heaven she picks the open scrolls that have the blueprints for the destinies of nations. She eats and then gets a prophetic action to speak out with clarity and authority to the nations, aligning them to the purposes of God, our King, for the glory of his holy name. Hallelujah. Take note also, that the bride judges from the courts of heaven. In Zechariah chapter 3 verse 7, Joshua was promised access to the courts of heaven if he was to remain obedient to God's ways. He was promised to rule God's house and have charge of his courts. Joshua is promised that he will exercise governmental authority if he remained obedient. He was actually given the promise that he would oversee the affairs of the Supreme Judge himself and make decisions in the courtrooms of the Supreme Judge. I suggest to us that the bride has that very same access from which she can rule and judge and make decisions affecting the destiny of nations. It is a high realm of government, but the bride is invited 
to approach and operate from there. I thought as I was reading this and preparing that actually this is among the highest ranked courts of the hierarchy of the courts of heaven. The invitation then to the bride is to ascend into the supernatural realm and exercise, exercise judgment from one of the highest ranked courts of heaven. What a privilege. What a privilege when the supreme judge gives you the mandate and the opportunity to judge and rule and make decisions with him. I think it is that context that the Lord says in Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Church is the ecclesia, the legislative, judicial government of the Lord on earth. Where does she do this from? From the highest of the ranged courts in the courtrooms, in line with permission and mandate from the Supreme Judge. Then consider the bride's comments, the garments of the bride as she approaches the court. In Revelation 19, 7 to 8, we read, Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to be clothed with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is a righteous deeds of the saints. The bride is described as wearing fine linen, bright and pure. The linen, we are told, is the righteous deeds of the saints. The bride's garment is righteous deeds. Her garments so speak before the court of heaven as she presents her case. Picture her standing. She stands and before she says anything, her garments are already speaking and they are telling the court, consider the righteous deeds which I am dressed with. In fact, that testimony then supports her petitions. So not only will she verbalize her petitions, but the testimony of her garments testifies as a witness of what she is petitioning the courts for. Imagine that. Imagine that. The garments speak of her righteous deeds and therefore of her right standing before the judge to hear her cases. This other aspect that I consider, I thought interesting, the jurisdiction of the bride before the courts of heaven. First, she stands as the bride of her advocate, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is also in court. Then the advocate is the son of the presiding judge, the supreme judge. And then consider that the judge knows the son's bride. She is known to the judge. In fact, the judge and the advocate both are in agreement and are working towards ensuring that the marriage between the bride standing before the courtroom and his son take place. I thought that was a very special category of jurisdiction that only the bride enjoys. That is the same jurisdiction that she enjoys in making the only prayer or petition that she is able to make only as a bride. Come, Revelation 22, 17. This is a prayer born out of love for the husband king, out of intimacy. This will be then the basis for any other prayer that the bride makes that is tied to or is linked to the hastening of the coming of the Lord. It's born out of intimacy, out of love, the bride for her husband king and for his purposes. So when we read in Matthew 24, 14, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come, has a bearing on the coming of the Lord and is linked to the bride's love for her husband king. So there should be an urgency in the voice of the bride 
as she petitions for the hastening of the preaching of the gospel so that her husband, king, may return without delay. What about the voice of the bride in the courtrooms of heaven? My view and my impression is that the voice of the bride is responded to even before the bride has said anything or raised her petitions before the courts. She is vindicated quickly even before she has petitioned or uttered anything to do with her case. Why do I say this? Consider the story of Abraham and Abimelech in Genesis chapter 20. Abimelech takes Sarah, Abraham's wife, as his wife. Then God comes to Abimelech in a dream in the night and tells him that he's a dead man for taking a prophet's wife. Abimelech defends himself and tells God, by the way, God, I did this out of the integrity of my heart. He himself said it's uh, his sister. Then God tells him, actually, I am the one who prevented you from sinning against me because I knew you did this out of the integrity of your heart. But then a verdict follows. From that court session between God and Abimelech, a verdict comes forth and it's an order for Abimelech to restore Sarah to Abraham or to die. Abimelech wisely chooses to make restoration. Then read Genesis 20 verse 15 and 16. It says, And Abimelech said, Behold, my land is before you. Dwell where it pleases you. Verse 16, To Sarah he said, Behold, I have given your brother a thousand pieces of silver. It is your vindication in the eyes of all who are with you. And before everyone, you are righted. Vindication is a legal term. Setting a right, a wrong, a right. Putting matters as they were. Restoration and a cash payment. Not though that in this court session between God and Abimelech, Sarah is not seen to say anything. Her vindication comes from the courtroom because she is a bride. She is a prophet's wife. What about the bride of the son of the judge? Will she not be vindicated spiritually? As I conclude, we are called to operate in the courts of heaven. Father is judge, and Jesus is our advocate, and God, the Holy Spirit, are all waiting for us to appear and make our cases and get our vindication. That's the same question the Lord puts out in Luke 18 as he tells the parable of the judge, the wicked judge and the widow. Shall we not be vindicated speedily? So I must say that the courtrooms are waiting for us to appear. Remember, they are not like our courts where if you go, you don't understand the language of the courtroom, you may sneeze and cough and before you know it, you are held in contempt. It's not like that. It's God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, waiting for us to present our cases so that we can be vindicated. Now, finally, the bride has unlimited access and unlimited jurisdiction. The Lord help us. Amen. Thank you very much, Minister Collins, for that very informative introduction to the protocols in the courts of heaven. And one of my takes or takeaways is the scripture that comes in the Old Testament where God says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. 
we similarly will perish for lack of knowledge. So we thank God for the information, the understanding. Now, I want us to pray, to make about three prayers from that sharing. One is that God would help us to understand how to present our cases to the court of heaven. We will have understanding. I want us to pray for understanding so that our prayers are not amiss. Our prayers don't hit where they are not supposed to hit. We need understanding. We have been told that, you know, there are official procedures to be followed before you present your case. And if you present your case in a way that is not applicable, then your case may be thrown out. So let's pray for understanding. Our Heavenly Father and our God, we thank you for the courts of heaven. Thank you for letting us know that there are courts and you have told us procedures of how to approach your courts in heaven. We thank you that, Lord, we have been enlightened. Our prayer, O oh God, is that we will have knowledge and understanding. Lord, deliver us from ignorance. The Bible says that the times of ignorance God has laid aside, but now commands all people to repent and to change because time has come for us to be more effective as the bride of Christ in the courts of heaven. So we pray that, Lord, you would help us, teach us, instruct us, open our understanding of all the procedures that we must follow when we come before you in the courts of heaven. If the earthly courts have procedures, how much more the heavenly courts need proper procedures so that we can be able to access your courtroom, O oh God. We thank you for enlightening us in these matters because we want to be more effective. We bless you and thank you, O oh Lord. Secondly, I want us to pray that we shall be properly prepared. Minister Collins re uh, reminded us that a case can be lost, a good case can be lost if we are not properly prepared. We can lose it. So we need proper preparation. And as part of the preparation, he has narrated a number of things that we need proper dress. Our hearts must be prepared. Our hearts must be properly dressed. Minded us that we must rend our hearts, not our garments. And also, we must come before the judge, the just judge, in holiness and repentance. So preparation is of utmost importance. We need to stand upon the word of God. That the purposes that we are bringing before God must be rooted in his word. So we must come prepared. We must have done our research properly. We must not come before the court with half-baked information. We must have our facts properly so that we can come before the judge and be able to present our case and present it in a manner that catches the attention of the judge. We are told that God is the judge. And Jesus is our advocate. Let's pray. Father, our prayer is that you would help us to be properly prepared. We know that when we come before earthly judges, we take a lot of time to prepare our cases, to get our facts right, to do proper research, to compare notes, and to do, make sure that everything is in place. Father, how much more we need to prepare when we come before the heavenly courts because the judge of the, the supreme judge of the heavenly courts is none other than God himself. And if we can honor our earthly judges, how much more 
do we need to honor the heavenly judge who is God himself? Lord, we repent for the ways in which we have treated our heavenly courts with half-baked information, assumptions, and Lord, we have not come prepared to be able to present our case, even when we have a good case. Forgive us for this, O oh Lord God, we pray. In the name of Jesus. I want us also to pray that we will get the counsel of the Lord. One of the things that I have, I have picked here is that the bride has access to all the courts of heaven. We can get the counsel because we need the counsel of the Lord so that we can be able to prophesy properly. We can be able to, you know, speak properly. So want us to ask for the counsel of the Lord, that the Lord will give us his counsel. The Lord will open his counsel in heaven to the bride. We will have access to that counsel so that when we present our case, it is like we have the, the facts ahead of time so that we can present our case properly because we have received the counsel of the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for opening our eyes to the fact that when we are in the courts of heaven, we are approaching you as judge, not as father, not as friend. And therefore, we need your counsel. How do we go about it, O oh Lord God? How do we present our case? What is your word concerning this case? What is your word concerning the matter at hand? Because if we don't know the word that you have spoken concerning this matter, we, if we do not know the law concerning this matter, we will not be able to present our case. Because when we have presented our case, then it is our turn to prophesy and to be able to align everything to God's purposes so that the will of God is done on the earth as it is done in heaven. So Lord, give us, reveal to us, we pray for revelation of your counsel concerning the matters that we bring to the courts of heaven that we will have the mind of Christ. We will come to the courts, Lord, with the knowledge that the enemy, the adversary, cannot counteract, cannot refute. Oh, this is our prayer, O oh God, even as we come to the courts of heaven. And lastly, about vindication, putting matters right, I am so impressed by this word that in the case of uh, Abraham and Abimelech, that Sarah did not even need to say anything. She was vindicated because, you know, she is as the bride of the prophet, and we are the bride of the Lamb of God, of the bridegroom. So let us pray that God will help us to put matters right. Especially as we talk about being more effective in our prayers. We have been told that there are some prayers that we have made which have not gotten anywhere. There are prayers that we have made which have not um, gotten an answer because we have not been able to present our prayers according to how God, how the court of heaven itself functions. So let's pray. Father, once again we are praying that as the bride of the bridegroom, as the bride of Christ, Lord, we look back when Sarah 
as the bride of Abraham did not even have to say anything because her vindication came from the Lord. We are praying our Father that you who knows us, you know us so well because we belong to Christ and Christ belongs to you. So you as the judge know us and Christ, the, our advocate, also knows us. And more than that, we, are, we have an intimate relationship with Christ between bride and bridegroom. So we are asking you to help us that even as we present our cases before you, we shall be vindicated and we shall be made to, start, to have the right standing before you. And our cases will be speedily met and answered. We thank you because of the, of the issues that you have clarified to us even as we have looked at the protocols to be followed in the courts of heaven. So, Father, we thank you and we bless you for these clarifications and we take them and from here, Lord, our desire is that we shall be those that will be able to present our cases before the courts of heaven with clarity and with, with uh, confidence and with boldness because we have followed the right procedures and we know that we have caught the eye of the judge. We thank you in advance and bless you. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. We look forward to having you tune in again tomorrow, Saturday, 2 p.m. Our topics for tomorrow are The Bride Accused and Vindicated by Reverend Phoebe Mogo. And our second topic will be Esther, the Biblical Model of the Bride in the Courts of Heaven by Pastor Benson Nyangor. God bless you.